Uh, hey, Jared, thanks for hanging out with me. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. It's good to be here. We finally got this. Uh, we got this together. The planets have aligned and here we are. Indeed. So what I wanted to do, I was going to pick your brain a little bit about your practice and kind of what's led you up to this point. And ultimately, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of software, some fun stuff that you're doing that I think mm -hmm. is interesting. Uh, and that's sort of the plan. Sound good? It sounds awesome. So tell me this, you're a Logan guy, right? Yes. When did, how long? Cause I thought we were both Logan guys. Cause I know you're in St. Louis or the mm -hmm. St. Louis area. Uh, when'd you get out of school? 2009 for the uh, DC and then uh, had another try or two to finish the master's sports science and rehab. So oh, wow. did both of those same time. Okay. I actually don't think they were offering that when I was there. No, I this... think I was, I wasn't the first, but I was like the second try that had that, that opportunity um, to do the dual program. So when you, when you got out, did you, what was your route? Was it associated? Did you, did you start on your own? Like, what was your route? I went After independent you? contract. Okay. Um, at that point in time, I think, you know, you could, uh, go in reverse or rewind, you know, coming out right after the, uh, uh, the housing bubble. Yeah. Right. And so it was kind of a rough time to come out. There wasn't a ton out there, uh, in terms of high quality opportunities. And I don't know if that's changed in the last 13 years or not, but <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah, I know, uh, but maybe a little bit worse. So, you know, I looked at that, nothing was really jiving with, uh, with employment. Uh, I'm pretty entrepreneurial at heart anyway. So I was looking at this and saying, unless I had like that unicorn scenario where yeah, I yeah. knew this is exactly how I wanted to practice. And this, this doc was going to support me, uh, in developing that way that I'd have to take that independent contract route. So, uh, ha had an opportunity, you know, relatively close to where I was living, um, grabbed onto that and, and, uh, <laughs> the rest is a long history, right? So were you, were you, was it another chiropractor that you're working yeah, on? Another chiropractor. He did nutritional response testing and, uh, and CBP. So really, uh, really nice guy, but couldn't be that much farther away from, from where I was in terms of how I practice. But, you know, with that, there can be harmony, you know, between, uh, between DC, sometimes it's all uh, vitriol, but, but we were able to make it work for almost two years. So you, you'd mentioned being entrepreneurial. Um, was that something you knew going into chiropractic college that kind of pointed you in that direction? Or is that something you just kind of found out about yourself as time went on? I think it was kind of a combination of both. Like, you know, if you would have asked, as you always say, if you would ask a 24 year old Jared, um, <laughs> you just say, Hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to make a buck here and figure things out. Yeah. Uh, but now I think, you know, looking back, there was always that drive to have some sort of control in my progression, right? I was never the type that said, hey, I just want to find this job and and just put in my time and go. It was more, hey, I want to I want to be able to create and want to be able to build something. I want to have, you know, options and opportunities. So, um, yeah, I think I didn't know, but deep down, that's just kind of who I'd always been. Yeah. Cause I know for me, like I was originally going to school to be a physical therapist and what pointed, what kind of pushed me from uh, physical therapy to chiropractic was I was interested in owning my own business and kind of being my own boss. So it was sort of a, it was almost like a tiebreaker for me where I thought, man, if I become a PT, I may end up working in a hospital and that sounds terrible. Yeah. Like if I become a chiropractor, like they're never going to hire me in a hospital. I'll have, I'll, I'll be forced to kind of I got options, baby. I got yeah. options. Yeah, I kind of burned the boats going into chiropractic thinking like, I, I think I want to own my own business. I think that's interesting to me, like being my own boss. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't know because when you said that, uh, I think that some people find that out through the fires of practice and some people kind of know it going in. And then yeah. some people don't know it at all, which I think uh -huh. is the the saddest scenario because you get ambushed getting out of chiropractic. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime I, I, you know, having practiced in the same place for 13 years, you know, you have young students, you have people interested in Cairo school. And the first thing I ask is how passionate are you about doing this? Yeah. Right. Because you have to have a massive level of passion to do this. If you're doing it for the money, you've, you've said this several times, Hey man, find just about anything else. Um, you can make great money and it's, it's yeah. possible. It's just, there's way better ways to do it. If there's that's easier your primary ways to make driver. Money. Yeah. yeah. 
If you, let me ask you this, this is totally off topic and not something I was going to ask you, but we were just talking about kids. Uh, if one of your kids came up to you and said they wanted to be a chiropractor, what would you say? I'd say the same thing. Um, you know, and I think that's kind of what I've always done is like, I always kind of, whatever advice I give is kind of what I'd give to my family. Yeah. Um, and I would tell them, Hey, you know, this is so rewarding. It's so fulfilling. Um, I would say too, they would be in better hands because I would be able to guide them, you yeah. know, through a little bit. Say, hey, don't, don't you do this. Don't you do that. They'd probably do it anyways, because they're like me and they'll just, you know, kind of do whatever they're going to do anyway. But um, I would feel a little bit better with it because I could steer them into yeah. the most lucrative type of scenario, which is out there. And it's starting to kind of grab hold, I think, in our profession is how a new way of looking at doing things um, that's that's not necessarily the old school methodology um, that's good for patients, it's good for doctors. And, and all of a sudden you can make a really good living without having to kind of sell your soul or or sell your your time so much. So um, I, I wouldn't be afraid to tell my, my daughter, or my son, yeah, go be a chiropractor. But at first most, I would always say, hey, how passionate about this? Is this who you are as a human being? Um, do you, I would actually, like, do you love this as much as gymnastics? And yeah. she said, absolutely. Yes. I'm like, let's rock and roll girl. You're going to do awesome. Yeah. I think second gen chiropractors have such a leg up, like such a huge leg up, um, over someone who's doing it for the first time. Yeah. I, I didn't have any, any business owners in my family, you know, that I was yeah. close with. And so thinking on that level, whether it's a second gen Cairo um, I think, yeah, you have multiple legs up, but if you're, you're coming from a business aspect, I think that's what most people don't realize is you don't go to be a doctor. You go to be a business owner who happens to be a doctor. Yep. Um, and so that business acumen is just, it's unfortunately still like we, we were joking about just a second ago, it doesn't exist coming out of school in terms of what, you know, schools are providing. So, um, yeah, knowing that business end is just so critical. So let me ask you this, because I'm curious what your opinion of, because I go back and forth about what my opinion is on this, but um, do you think it's the school's job to teach chiropractors business? No. And, you know, I've heard this from another guy who uh, I listen, I love podcasts. So that's why how I learned about you first is just kind of listening to your podcast. There's another guy out there who has a very firm you know, response to this. And I'm, I'm in that same camp of saying, why would you want to learn from most people who have to teach because they never were able to maybe fully make it, you know, as a chiropractor. It's oh, like, I would why? not suggest, I would not suggest the people that are there now teach business. <laughs> right. And, and that's what I'm getting at. And that's, that's yeah. what, what's at there. So he's like, no, it's and, and realistically, I kind of cut the schools um, some slack as well, because their primary function is to make sure that um, the kids are passing boards so that yeah, they're I would agree um, with that. clinically competent. Um, I have talked a lot uh, and what we're trying to do um, with our P3 program is, is, create better opportunities for young docs to have, uh, you know, that, that mentorship or that guidance or, or a better flow from when they graduate to when they're operating their own practice. So it's not just a, well, here you go. Good luck. It's more of a, Hey, I have different options or different mechanisms out existing in the, in the chiropractic field that just make it easier. Uh, talk, talk about that program since you brought it up, like the, because this was a conversation I had with one of my buddies when we were talking about should chiropractors uh, or should chiropractic college teach business. And we, he's, he had suggested that chiropractic schools should uh, open up avenues for people to learn business, but not necessarily like, so he would look at it like uh, clubs are bringing somebody in or like they, they should create as many opportunities as possible, but it wasn't necessarily their primary job to, to like, we're going to sit you down and make you take chiropractic business 101 right. because, right. And, and I, I liked his perspective uh, on that. And I think this P3 thing that you're talking about sort of lines up with that, where it's yeah. like, you have this, this third party coming in that the school is allowing you to do that and it's helping prepare in that area, but the school's not taking the the lead on that no. in the academic sense. I, I would agree with all of that, you know, fully and saying that, you know, before I don't, 
to kind of bring it all together. It's, I'm not saying that the school shouldn't teach it at all. I think that there should be um, some curriculum that, that provides baseline awareness of what it means to run a business and what it means um, beyond, you know, assessment and treatment more in terms of how do I run a business? Um, but you think about that, that's almost like, okay, you're going to take three months to, uh, learn how to play basketball. Right. And then you think you're going to come out and be good about it. Yeah. You know, that's not the case, right? Yeah. You might know how to dribble. You might know how to make a free throw, but leading, uh, leading the fast break. Yeah. You're not quite there yet. Um, so I think, you know, the school has something, uh, a responsibility to at least plant the seeds, um, but what we're trying to do with P3 is, is we call it uh, potential patient progressions or potential practice progressions, where two times a try, I'll have people out to uh, my facility and we go into the CrossFit gym area um, so we can host, you know, 25, 50 people and, and we go through a case study or we'll go through something in practice um, that gets people to start thinking about the realities of, of how to manage a patient or the realities of how to develop a business that can grow quickly, that can scale accordingly, but be profitable, you know, very quickly. And, uh, and what I've noticed is that the the students are really appreciative. And that's the biggest thing is, you know, there, there's reasons I want to get out there. I want to, you know, expand my brand to a certain degree, but I have a overwhelming desire to make sure that chiropractic leverages the opportunity that we have right now. That's never been better post COVID post Fauci, we'll say yeah. there's never been let more distrust in the medical model. Um, and I'm not against it. My wife is a physician assistant. It's just, this is a golden opportunity for chiropractic to really gain market share. Uh, and I, and I hope that a lot of docs who've been out seven, 10, 15 years can really start providing those opportunities. I actually don't think I've ever thought about that. Like I haven't thought about the fact that um, chiropractic being an alternative to the medical profession, you know, we've always kind of been the the bastard child of the health profession, you know, where it's like, we, you know, it's like we help people, but we're not really part of the medical profession. And a lot of people that are skeptical of the medical profession tend to gravitate toward chiropractic or at least conservative care. Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't actually thought about the fact that that would, the, the, all the nonsense that's going on, maybe it's because I'm not in practice, but it's like the, all the nonsense that's going on actually creates an opportunity mentally with people that might be more open to try chiropractic. Oh yeah. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's not like the the floodgates have opened right? sure. but at the same time. It's, you know, the barriers that you're talking about that I started with, or maybe even they were, they were perceptions on my part when I started, but there were more barriers to entry in terms of, oh, I go to a chiropractor. Whereas now, especially over the last five years with what's happened to uh, primary care physicians, how they've just kind of been absorbed by uh, urgent cares and, you know, yeah. internal med, you know, or, yeah. or just absorbed by the hospital system. It's like, there's a bunch of people out there that just want a relationship with a healthcare provider. And we're sitting there like, yep, we've, we've always been here. We got a pretty good model. So, um, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's not easy to be a chiropractor, but it's, I think it's, it's a, an awesome time, um, for young chiropractors coming out. They have a lot better opportunity. So your, explain a little bit your practice style and, and le like, what was the plan initially? I mean, did you, cause you mentioned the the gym as well, which I'm interested in. Cause I, I've, I've never, I mean, my practice never had a gym, you know, connected to it or associated with it. Kind of explain sure. like your practice style, kind of how you go about things. And then uh, just, was that originally the plan or you kind of, kind of morphed into it? Like how was, just, just talk to me about what you do and why you do it. Definitely not the initial plan uh, based off of what, you know, what, what I was really passionate about, but it, like you said, it morphed into that. It became, became something I was like, Hmm, maybe I should do this. And this is kind of, you know, the merger of health and fitness. Um, that's what I started with. So unintentionally, I was, I was kind of uh, progressing towards that. I always said health and performance center where we merge health and fitness for your wellness. So uh, I always wanted to leverage the, um, you know, chiropractic adjustment with with more with soft tissue mobilization with rehabilitative exercise because uh, you you forgot to ask me how I how I got into chiropractic but uh, you know my story on that was I was a three sport athlete in high school I played college football and chiropractic was one of the only things that would keep me 
on the competitive field, but I was always running through the same problems, right? It was, it was the best bandaid, but it was still just a bandaid in terms of what was going on. So um, in my sophomore, junior year of college, I was an undersized quarterback and, you know, taking a beating a little bit. So I had some back issues and all of a sudden I got, you know, pretty much what I see now is they were, they were taking uh, chiropractic with some soft tissue stuff and then merging it with some Pilates. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I feel so rock solid and stable. Um, yeah. never had felt better. And so I kind of looked at that and said, well, if you, if you take this and take chiropractic, what it can do segmentally so well, and then you merge it with what you can do with soft tissue and what you can do with good movement and good, uh, rehabilitative process, you have a really good, um, way of not only making people feel better, but stabilizing their condition and, and solidifying a long-term relationship with your patients. So that's where it started. Um, I think my sister started a CrossFit gym, you know, in 2014, and I saw how awesome that was for her and her husband um, that I, from there, it was like, yeah, I should do this. So um, it was more of an add on as opposed to an initial thought. Yeah. I think a lot of things are that way. Like it, a lot of things in practice, like, and I, and I, I try to encourage young docs to be open to that, where it's just like a lot of finding success, especially when you're talking about the nuts and bolts, like what works and what doesn't work. It's just the willingness to kind of just try something and go in this particular direction or go in that particular direction and then uh, see how it works. And if it works, you know, you, you go with it. And if it doesn't work, you modify it, or maybe you go in a different direction. And it's just the willingness to do that's important. Difference between, you know, wearing blinders and at least having something that can wipe your eyes, right? You, yeah. you don't want to be open to too many things, but at the same time, you have to be open enough for modification and adaptation so that you're always growing or else you're stuck. Man, that's the balance. Like that's hard. It's, it's the mm-hmm. balance of, of when do you know? And I think, I think the longer you go into business and, and the more you kind of, the more things you see, the better people, better you get. It's, it's just discernment. But mm-hmm. it's like, when is it a good time to be patient? Because some things take time and you just Absolutely. have to let them grow and simmer. And when is it time to make a small change? When is it time to make a big change? Uh, when is it time to abandon what you're doing and go in a different direction? Those are very, very hard decisions to make as a small business owner. They are, but I'll, I'll leverage this back towards you. I've been a client of yours in the past. And I think, you know, platforms like yours, like others, um, where you can get the resources to make, to, to provide a little bit more clarity on what the right decision is. Yeah. Uh, I talk to a lot of young docs right now or, or students and, you know, what do I need to do? What seminar do I need to take? And blah, blah, blah. I'll have my standard advice for that. But then I'm like, what, how are you going to invest? Uh, who are you going to use to um, smooth your road to help you make those decisions yeah. or help provide clarity? Because paying, uh, you know, however many thousands of dollars for that early in the game so that you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars later, yeah, it, it's tough to weigh that opportunity cost when you're 26 years old or 28 years old out of, out of school. But when you're 40, you know, 43, like you are, I'm about ready to be 41. And you look back and you're like, crap, if I just would have had somebody to tell me, yeah. you know, to be that dad, that second gen Cairo. Yeah. Like crap, I would have been so much farther. It, it's tough, but you know, I would say you get that, or you're providing some of that clarity in in the uh, services with Next Step and uh, and some of the other things that you're doing. You know what? It's it's standing on the shoulders of giants, and it is the the problem in our profession is that historically, and we talked about this before we started recording, is that. One of the issues you have is you don't know who's a giant and who's the scarecrow, like who's the person that's 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 offering to help you and making all kinds of promises. And yeah. and that's who's, part of that discernment. Who's the real deal? Who's inflatable? Well, yeah. And that's yeah. The, the, the discernment's difficult because you don't know what you don't know. And so like you and I, it's like if you've been around for a little while and you've made your mistakes and you've learned this and you've read this and you've studied this and you've, you have some wisdom and experience that comes along with that, you you can hear some stuff and go, hmm, it doesn't, it doesn't pass the sniff test. Like there's something not right about that. And that can save you some trouble. But when you're getting started, um, you don't necessarily have that. And 
which is why typically I encourage people to make small investments. Yeah. Uh, initially, it's like don't spend, don't sign up for the twenty thousand dollar program when you're right out of school, with it with the, for the person that you have no idea if they're <laughs> legit or not. Unless you've had four people who've gone through that program who've said, yeah, yeah, this made me so much that, that I would have paid twice. Transfer of it. trust. Yeah, that transfer that, of trust. It. But if you're like, nah, I think I'll choose this one. Based off because of I saw one. an Instagram ad or because <laughs> exactly. I saw I read one video. Google review that they pinned, yeah. you know, to the top and it's like, yeah. well, okay, no, the, the understandings there. Plus, you know, I've been through some uh, other practice management scenarios. Some have been phenomenal. Some have been like, oh my God, I got to get away from this as fast as possible. Unfortunately, yeah. like you said, um, we were talking before there's, there's those things out there that, that do create that skepticism. And I think some skepticism is healthy, but if you don't don't have the discernment uh, to be able to sit down and say, Hey, I got to make a timely decision. But like you said, it's a small enough investment. So if it doesn't go well, I can always backpedal from here and start yeah. moving on that other path. Um, that That's good advice. Yeah. And ultimately, ultimately the bottom line is you got to do something like when you come out of, like, if you're, if you're a relatively new person out of chiropractic college, you are not equipped to run a small business. Like you, you have to do something. I, I don't care if it's read a book, if listen to free podcasts, watch videos, like it's some like there's free stuff, paid stuff. There's, there's structured, less structured. Like there's, there's a lot of options that are out there. If you think you are qualified and equipped to be successful right out of school, man, you are just, you're going to run head hundred miles an hour into a brick wall. It's yeah. just because you, you just don't know what you don't know and you need help. So you got to do something. Yeah. You can't just hope that it's going to work out. No, I think action, you know, always provides data. Right. And so yeah. it might not provide the data that you love, but the sooner that you're acting, the more that you're collecting that data, you can either plow forward or, or start to pivot relatively quickly, but <laughs> this is never a good strategy. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, no, you got to act, but, but, uh, you know, again, I'll just say you got to be willing to act. I, I talked to my yeah. associate even about that today, and we're doing some things now that are kind of forcing that action is to say, Hey, I'm 13 years in you're 18 months in. we're different people. We need to get you exposure to different things and, and more people within your realm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm willing to act on that. I'm willing to invest in that. Cause I know it's going to be good for you. Um, and in turn, it's going to be good for me as well. But to sit back and sit there and hope that he's going to turn this corner, um, that doesn't make any sense, uh, especially when there's something out there that I can invest in that that saves me time, saves me energy uh, and gets results. Yeah, you have to spend money to make money, um, but you just have to know where to 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 allocate those funds. Why do you think having dealt with like associates and stuff and students, like, why do you think that some people are so ready to like, they want to learn, they want to apply, like they, they, they go at it with a, with a hungry humility and, and kind of go about it the right way. And then other people feel like there's a, a bit of an entitlement, I guess, or a bit of a, of a, you know, I didn't want to do this or I didn't go to school for this or whatever. Like, like what, what's the difference? Is it just a personality thing or is it just random? I mean, like why? I, Cause I know that there's a huge difference between people that how they approach things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when uh, we, we have a bunch of shadows coming in um, and they're transitioned to interns and help me out. And, and part of that process is they get verbally assaulted by my associate uh, not in a bad way, more in a, Hey, let's, let's talk about this concept or this neuro neurological pathway or, you know, yada, yada. And I, I heard them talking about, uh, certain pathways from, from having pain and having experience that allows some people, um, when they sprain an ankle or when they, you know, tweak their neck or their low back to be like, ah, I'll be okay in about a, two weeks right? Because they've had that experience. They've had those battle scars. They've had those those wounds that they've had to come through. Whereas other people who don't have those neurological pathways or those the, that awareness of, of what it's going to take, um, they, they panic, they freak out over something that's, that's very minimal. 
Yeah. Uh, and so I think that there's many ways to answer that it could be personality traits, could be upbringing, could be this, that, and the other thing. It's not a matter of, of deciding what that is. It's more the idea, how many battle wounds do you have? How many things have you overcome? And those people who've been through more trials and come out because of their own hard work, I think they have that awareness to be like, yeah, throw whatever in front of me. I can figure out stuff, figure things out because I'm a problem solver. Whereas if you don't have that problem solver mentality or background, any little thing is going to seem like an insurmountable object that you can't overcome. So what do you end up doing? You end up bitching about it. You end up, you know, finding yeah. like-minded people who bitch about it. So you feel comfortable. And then all of a sudden it's a cascade of not good. So let me ask you this. If you, um, if you're hiring an associate, do you have a question that you would ask them to help identify that person? Like, cause obviously you're looking for the person that has that drive versus someone who maybe doesn't. Is there a question or line of questions or something you're specifically looking for? Cause obviously like you could make yourself miserable by hiring a person that's just kind of mentally in the wrong space. Correct. Correct. I think, you know, for me, uh, I've always loved just talking with people and relatively quickly um, in, in candid conversation, I kind of understand who this person is just by, you know, simple lines of questions, but um, trying to find an uncomfortable scenario for them and, and see how they manage it. Um, there was one time I said, hey, um, if you uh, if you're interested in this, send me a, a video. Why? Right. And so pretty much it was, uh, I want someone who's not afraid to generate a video of themselves and send it to me explaining yeah. something. Somebody's yeah. comfortable enough to do that because the person who's not isn't comfortable enough to go out and do the marketing necessary and, and to learn the things that you need to learn on a fast basis to be able to succeed. So it was almost a filter situation. Um, you know, other times it's just been, you know, tell me a, your classic, tell me about a time or blah, blah, blah. And then, and then taking it to the next level of, Hey, what if this would have happened? Trying yeah. to knock them off guard and seeing, okay, how do they handle this unknown unknowable? If they handle it well, then I know, yeah, they kind of have some context. They have stuff that, that they can, uh, draw from to, to help them in an uncomfortable situation. Whereas if they're like, yeah. You know, yeah. then, you know, okay, we might need some more battle wounds before you get to join me. Yeah. So let's talk about this. Um, you were telling me about this software that you put together um, that, and would you explain it as a, would you categorize it like as a patient education software or as a, I know it is a uh, compliment to the chiropractor and what the chiropractor is doing and it's an aid um, but how would you describe what it is? Yeah, I think uh, clinical operations assistant. Okay, what does that mean? That sounds sophisticated. It is, right? <laughs> we put a lot of thought into that one. But, you know, realistically, there's a lot of things out there, you know, customer relations management, CRM systems, you know, obviously practice management systems that are there to help the front desk or that are there to help marketing what's out there right now to help the physician do their job better and connect on a deeper level with the patient in more of the trenches of their progression. It doesn't really exist too much. So that that's the need that we saw that we can make um, doctors that much more efficient on three levels. Uh, you talked about the patient education, right? And just kind of making it very simple, one, one and done type scenarios so that, um, you know, any office's, you know, brand can be built into this uh, platform so that they only have to do it once, but they can easily get that injected to every single patient. The next one is is compliance, especially with home exercise programs. I'm a rehab Cairo, so that's the big thing that we were looking at is, okay, if I send this person home with a handout, what's the likelihood that they're going to do it? And even if yeah. they do, are they going to do it well? And that, that was a struggle, um, a passion for me that I had to try so hard to get that patient to really understand what they needed to do, how they needed to do it, and why it was important. And now we have a software that does that in seconds. Um, because we have the videos there, we teach from the videos, uh, the patient can reference the videos. So the compliance and then the outcomes generated just skyrocket because you have your rehab tech built into a, a massively inexpensive software. Uh, and then the last one is the assessment, that initial buy-in. 
the assessment feature, being able to say, hey, patient, remember you were right here on day one. You can you can do an, uh, an actual status versus an ideal status. We do it with motion assessment. Um, but being able to go through that even on visit one or visit two and say, hey, I know you have pain, but this is why you have pain. And the patient can't disagree with that, right? Because they're looking at themselves on yeah. video or on a still frame. And you you quickly get the patient to stop thinking about pain and start thinking about their functionality or about their posture. And all of a sudden they get competitive with saying, Ooh, that's me. I don't like that. I want to be better doc. Help me, help me not look like that. Yeah. Um, it, it does those things, uh, those three things incredibly well. So that's why we call it more of a, a clinical operations assistant. So let's, let's kind of go through these kind of individually. Cause I, I want people, cause as you're talking to me, I've seen the software, like I've seen sure. the software, we've kind of talked about it and I kind of have a better idea of what that practically looks like. Um, and I know a lot of people are just going to be listening to this. So I kind of wanted to just walk through mm -hmm. some of these individually. So the, is this a, um, is this an app or is this like on the computer? Is this access through the website? Like how is the, how do people get usage of the actual software? Are you talking on the doctor end or on the patient? Patient end. Patient end, a uh, doctor sets up their profile through TelecareRx website, right? Through their um, doctor's um, account. And so you create a patient. Patient gets an email, patient logs in, they have their profile. And that becomes your portal of communication. It's almost like a virtual practice mm. um, that, that the patient has certain access to, but the doctor is in charge of that access. So, And they're accessing it through their web browser? Correct. Okay. Correct. So it's just like an Amazon username, password. You yep. go to your profile, boom, there you have it. Okay. The... Uh... And the patient education stuff, um, I know that when we had talked before about the value of videos, you know, where it's like, as chiropractors, we find ourselves having the same conversations over and over and over and over again, because it needs to be done. Like it needs to be, there's, there's it's critical it's, information. Yeah. Whether it's how you do your practice or understanding how your body works or whatever, it's like that last patient, that new patient that comes in they didn't hear the thing you said to the 15 other people that month, you know? Correct. And so the power of having a library or a, a resource where either it's someone else's material or your material that is explaining to them these particular things, it makes it so that the communication is, is shorter in the office. It's reinforced with the information and it kind of saves you time. And it also kind of helps with, the retention of it too, because they can, they can view that resource later. So just, just kind of talk about your thought process there. Yeah. I think you, you put it down really well there in terms of saying when, when I would, you know, talk to a patient, I think when every chiropractor talks to a patient, especially students, when they're almost forced into a two hour new patient, you know, visit, yeah. Yeah. we know that's not realistic, but we come out and we're thinking, oh my gosh, my brand, what I'm doing, what I'm trying to get injected into this patient's brain, this patient needs to hear it. But at the same time, the patient can only retain so much. Yeah. So it's kind of this, you know, uh, a fight of realities here in terms of the doctor. Hey, I have to give you this information, but the patient's like, I can only take so much. So I only got three things that I'm going to take. Well, I started looking at that and saying, all right, what's the important things that I need? They need to know the concepts in my office. They need, which is my kind of my secret sauce. Yeah. They need to know ice and heat, right? Cause that's just something, you know, my recommendations I'm going to give every patient when they're acute day one, they need to know their exercise strategy and they need to know their exercise sequencing. Now those are four high level concepts that we just dump into their patient education profile and highlight, Hey, when you need information here, you go to your profile and you get to yeah. hear me talk about it. Yeah. Um, and if the patient in that moment says, oh, doc, what is your ice and heat recommendations? I say, well, we ice in the evening, five to seven minutes on for, you know, two to three times before you go to bed. We do it in the morning heat for, you know, five to 10 minutes, depending on what you want. And don't worry, patient, you don't have to remember that. It's right here in this video for you to reference when you yeah, forget yeah. and when you go yeah. home or when you lose your new patient packet, you know, you're not going to lose the internet. It's always going to be there for you. So, yeah. yeah, that's something that, um, I actually started doing when I very first time I started doing videos in my practice, 
was for that purpose. It wasn't for marketing. It wasn't for any other reason. It was just for, I'm having these same conversations over and over again. And I don't think that people are retaining as much as what I would like them to, because I, you know, I could, I got no problem sitting there giving you this big, long explanation. I have a tendency to talk too much. So it's like, I can tell you this stuff, but you know, people just aren't retaining it. Mm -mm. And then at some point it becomes, it's just exhausting to be like, exactly. Oh my gosh, like we, it's we've exhausting talked about for this everyone. Four the times. It's like, I want to get out of here. You know, yeah. doc, you did a great job. Stop talking so much. Um, you know, and then, you know, you, you potentially, if this is the fourth time that you've gone through it, how well are you doing it compared to the first one? Yeah. Whereas, you know, the video doesn't change. You do it once really well, and then you're good to go there. So yeah. it was, it was a major streamline effect of, of killing, killing monotony, killing repetition, and then creating more power for the things that are more important, which is, you know, the, the sitting down and actually listening to the patient's story, right? You don't think I have 24 things that I have to go through. Now you only have four things and you can intensify your power on the things that matter most to the patient. Uh, so in terms of patient compliant with the videos, so, because obviously it's like you have just because you have a video and just because it's available and just because you have a resource, that doesn't mean that people are going to actually consume it. Like there's a percentage of people that are just going to be like, they're not going to listen to the video or pay attention any more than they're going to pay attention to anything else you said. And mm -hmm. so what, what percentage of patient compliance do you have with this? And then kind of what's the, you know, what is your expectation with someone to, to use the system that you have? Yeah, whether whether a patient's compliant or not, you know, it is relevant, but it's still somewhat irrelevant, right? The the idea is um, how many excuses can you take away from the patient, right? Um, a lot of times people aren't non-compliant because not because they don't want to do it, is they don't know how or they don't know what or they don't know when, you know, those yeah. types of things. Granted, there are these patients who um, who are never going to be fully compliant, but the more I've used this, most people, when they're hurt, they'll do anything. They'll turn in four different circles and jump upside down and, you yeah. know, five times on one foot, if it's going to help them with their pain. So what we've saw is a lot of those patients who would be your non-compliant patients, they, they start having more compliance because you're just setting a better connection piece for your education and if they, if you give them something simple, I think that's the bigger thing is these people who would be seen as non-compliant, you give them something very simple, that's very beneficial for their specific need. Um, and they start getting results from that. They'll do anything that you tell them yeah. to do. It's just having that platform and communication um, that, that allows them to understand what it is, why you're asking them to do it. So we've seen compliance go through the roof, but more importantly, um, getting that patient connection as to why they're doing it, the, the time necessary to do that is is minuscule in comparison to what it was without. Yeah, that's that's actually the thing that I was thinking of is that uh, a non-compliant patient, if they're really going to be a problem, they're going to be non-compliant whether you spent 30 minutes talking to them or you referred them to a video. <laughs> And yep. the benefit of the video is you didn't spend 30 minutes talking yeah. to them. <laughs> and if they, if they come back and they're like, doc, it doesn't hurt. Hey, show me your exercise. Well, I didn't do it. Okay. Why not? Yeah. You, you really don't care about yourself or you just, you're just that lazy. Nobody wants to have that conversation. So in a way yeah. they'll either be honest with you and say, Hey man, I'm sorry. I didn't do it. At least I'm honest. How many times have I heard that? Well, several, but you know, not as much as you'd probably think. I have a lot of students say, well, what do you do for non-compliant patients? And I'm like, well, I, I don't really have any anymore because they don't have a choice. They're either doing this with me or not. And then uh, what you were saying before is, do you even want a non-compliant patient? Yeah. <laughs> right. This is a way to get them out of your practice really fast if they know they're going to be on the hook. Uh, Cause you don't want to waste your time on that type of a person anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting that uh, sometimes, and I I only say this. I uh, the reason I'm kind of asking this is because I know it's going to be asked. Like it's mm -hmm. it's one of those like I have these these questions that I can immediately hear someone asking me, and my brain is like, well, what about this? And I, one of the thoughts I know from existing practices, uh, and especially young docs, are going to kind of be like, well, how do you get people to how do you get people to do that, or how do you, um, you know because it's so different than what they're currently doing. And, and my response to that would be the things you make normal are normal. And the things that are 
you that are not normal or not normal. So it's like, there's a little, it's a little weird, like transitioning from it to anything new, but especially the new people, like if you have good procedures and systems coming in, it's just normal for them. So the practice uh, sort of sorts out some of those problems as time goes on, because if you're consistently using any system uh, for, you know, months and months or a year or whatever, then it becomes normal. Everybody's used to it. It's not a big deal. Eventually, like getting the 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 new people to kind of shift over, that's that's a little bit harder. Or the mm-hmm. I'm sorry, the, the current people to kind of shift over, that's a little bit harder. Uh, but the issue with like it's weird or anything like that, I don't I don't think that's really an that's a temporary issue. Yeah. I think too is you know, if if you're knocking your outcomes out of the park and you're not and you're super busy. Um, but you're not burnt out. Okay. Maybe this isn't for you. How many of those chiropractors exist? Yeah. Not too many. Right. So if you're super busy, all right, how do you avoid burnout? How do you, how do you get more efficient with the processes that you're working? Um, if you're struggling, if you're bringing patients in, but they're, they're struggling, you're struggling to get them to understand why they need care. Okay, this is going to solve that problem with the assessment feature. If you get that, but you're struggling with results in terms of getting people to carry out their treatment plans, okay, that that compliance feature is going to be there. You're going to be able to now have this assistant that allows you to really start to attack any issue that you have in a a practice. And uh, like you were talking about, that system should provide you with the data. And then it's your job to be able to modify it um, for your benefit. So you know, that's, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is to where, where are people, where and how are people com, um, getting their information? Where are they communicating? And a lot of this is based off and set up like a combination of meta platforms being Facebook and Instagram, as well as Snapchat. So it's mm-hmm. like, we're, we're setting this up, the patient interaction between you and you and the, uh, you and your patients to be something that the patient really appreciates in terms of convenience, but also really likes communicating in that way. So, um, you know, there's, there's definitely differences to standard norms, but guess what? We've been stuck at 10% market share for how many years? 50, yeah. 150. Um, we're going to have to do some things differently here to, uh, to really boost us forward as being in, out in front. And I think this is an opportunity for that. One of the things that I think is really interesting, um, uh, is and I I'm an advocate of is uh, chiropractors that get out and they start a micro practice where they are because in this day and age like it's it's difficult to get a loan and I don't even know that new docs should get out take out a hundred thousand dollar loan or something crazy you know put themselves behind the eight ball and and buying a practice not, and there's, not there's, unless they have a lot of certainty and a lot of people behind them yeah right yeah. on their so, own hell no don't you yeah. do that. So, yeah. so that's why I'm an advocate of the micro practice. It's like working out of somebody else's space, uh, working as a solo doc. And when people like that, um, when, when people are in situations like that, what I typically will tell them is that you need to automate things that can be automated. You need to leverage technology, like, you know, the human experiences that need to be human experiences, you leave them that way. But there's a lot of things that we do that don't need to be human experiences and they can be automated with software. And this is one of those situations where to me, the two extremes of people I see that can benefit from something like this is I already have a really busy practice, you know, we're killing it. And we, we, I just need to find some relief somewhere. And, and I need some, some software to kind of help me with, to find that relief. And then the other side of it is someone who is doing everything by themselves and they need to have software and they need to have technology help them because they can't do everything themselves and they need to be able to free themselves up. Absolutely. Uh, I think you, (laughs) what we're developing in my practice is, is a multi-micro model right, is trying to have multiple micro practices out of the same facility. So you're, you're trying to uh, minimize the dollars per square foot that you spend in terms of costs while you're maximizing the dollars per square foot. So 
Um, I think that's, it's a trend um, that is new school thought that I think that our, our profession really needs to grab onto. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's the most lucrative way to do it. But I also think that too many standalone chiropractors is also a problem. So we need to kind of say, okay, how do, how do people come together long-term to kind of create a, a first phase hospital system, right? Right now, what do you have? You have a massive hospital that you go to when you're super sick. Well, what if there was a type of new age hospital that had three or four awesome micro practices in it connected with the gym, right? All of a sudden the need for that, that end stage you know, a uh, hospital, it, it goes away, it evaporates. So I think that model is huge. But in building that, if you can hire someone, meaning a technology that you pay for one day's work, and you get for a full month or a full year, right, and, and you're able to wow the patient, as well as intensify the power that you have to, uh, to change their life, it's just a massive catalyst to get a micro practice going uh, and going efficiently with a extremely low overhead, which at the end of the day was, that's what it's all about. Yeah. So tell me, tell me this, and I think we'll probably end with this. And what I'm going to encourage people to do is I'm actually going to encourage people to get connected to you and to do, if you're interested, do a demo because there's no possible way that you could really understand what exactly we're talking about. Cause I, that's the thing that I'm kind of getting here. And I, I hate this feeling, but I feel like without the visual and without actually walking through it, it's going to be really hard for people to understand how it can help. So I think to kind of solve that problem, I'm going to just like encourage people to reach out to you and do a demo and just see yeah. how it works. If you're interested, because I think that that's going to be a, no matter how much we talk, I think it's going to be more effective uh, to get a good basis of what am I actually looking at? How can this help me? I think that yeah. to actually see it is going to make more sense. But before we kind of wrap it up, um, I did want to talk about the visual assessment part of it and, and why, because I think that a lot of times um, one of the things I hate, I, I guess about chiropractic, that we don't do a great job of is showing people why chiropractic can help them beyond just like, I feel better. Like, it's great that you feel better. Like I'm, I'm, I love that you feel better, but having some sort of measurable objective thing that we can, you know, like medical doctors have lab tests and they have MRIs and CT, whatever, they got all kinds of stuff that they could do something objective. And, and I, I wish that chiropractors had more, and that certain techniques have different things that they do that are maybe they're, they're better at this than others. But I think chiropractic as a whole, we would be better off if we could develop more objective means to validate what we do. It's not just I great that you're feeling better, but now look at this. And this is like more ironclad proof that, that we're helping this person in an objective way. And so talk a little bit about the visual assessments or the movement assessments and why those are important and kind of how your, your software helps all that. Absolutely. Um, even before we go there, you brought up the other point, like, I think a demo is always super important, but even before that, you know, just reaching out to me and let's have a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I, I love talking with people. I love kind of figuring out what their scenario is so that we can tailor the demo. So it's not sitting here saying, hey, the only way you can talk to me is, is if we do a demo, it's more, hey, let's chat. Let's see where you're at with your practice, what things might benefit you. And then we'll move to a tailored demo to see how, how it can help you specifically. Um, but then, you know, back to, you know, the assessment feature, you know, posture has always been massive in chiropractic, Yeah. right? What we do is like, you can use this assessment feature just for posture. You could have a patient stand there and, you know, then draw horizontal lines and vertical lines based off of their posture. It auto populates um, now uh, lines on the patient. So it makes it easy and fluent to, to do things. Um, but the big thing is, hey, if you take it a step farther and have them do a couple of movements, that are standardized, that, that we have different poses, all of a sudden the patient has personal connection to that, 
right? And and I see it in my office all the time as patients just really almost becoming emotionally connected to that assessment feature and saying, that's me, that represents my problem, but also I want to be the best variation of me. You can't really do that with an x-ray, right? You can't really do yeah, that yeah. with M an MRI that's inside of me. But when they see themselves in the moment going through these things, um, they, they then almost have a story that they can look at. And that's the beginning of their story. And then as you sequentially progress them through reassessments, they get to see their progressions and, and watching patients get competitive and excited. And, you know, they tell me, Hey doc, next visit is my, my reassessment. I'm going to crush yeah. it. I'm like, okay, man, sweet. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see it. We'll go over it. It might be great. It might not. But the big thing is you care and you're aware and you're moving forward and you feel better. Patients are like, yeah, thanks doc. Can't wait to see you next time. I mean, my practice is awesome yeah. <laughs> because those are 90% of the conversations that we have. Um, and I think that assessment feature, because it sets such a good storyline for the patient, it makes, you know, progressing them sequentially through their care just very easy because I just get to be the guide in their story. And, and the, uh, the book is the software. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about movement that I think is also really convincing um, is that I have my own personal movement thing where it's like, as I get older, sometimes I move how I remember my dad looking uh. and it's, and it's, it's kind of a weird thing to describe other than I just will feel myself, whether it's, you know, get the way I get up or something like that. And I have this like flash in my brain of a memory yeah. of my dad and thinking to myself, it's it's actually that weird thing that happens in my brain kind of convinces me I need to spend that little bit of extra time doing some stretches, doing some different things that maybe I've been neglecting yeah. because it and it's a movement motivation and it's not on a screen. But if I I can tell you what, if I saw myself on a screen and my thought was that looks like dad, uh, oh, because I no. know that's I know that's what it is. Like I'm a hundred percent aware yeah. that when I stop moving well, I look like my dad. Yeah. And I love my dad. Uh my dad was a great man, but he did not move well. <laughs> yeah. and, we uh we have that conversation all the time because of the assessment. Yeah. Um, and the patient says, I don't want to end up like this, or I saw somebody in the grocery store that's relatively my age. And then we have the, my age versus, you know, other people, you know, from my practice is we get people thinking they can find their relative fountain of youth, Yeah. but it's hard to get them. <laughs> I have my associates or my, uh, my, uh, interns come in and they're like, that person just talked about their posterior hip capsule feeling tight. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, we just in the process of kind of going through what we go through, it sets that foundation of communication. Yeah. But then they are also talking about, hey, I saw this other guy in the grocery store and I, I'm so glad that I don't look like that anymore. Yeah, You know, that's, that's one thing. You can get that just by making somebody feel better after three visits. But when you have this, you know, baseline at the beginning and then you can see the se sequential progression, it just drives that much deeper into the patient. And that's going, what I've seen for me massively is the retention level of my patients. They, I just retain patients with almost zero effort in terms of progressing to maintenance yeah. because it's a no brainer. It's like, I don't even have to talk about it. It's just sitting right there on the software. Yeah. The, uh, we, there's that joke in chiropractic that if, if your spine was on your face, you'd take better care of it. And what you do in that with the visual assessment and emotion assessment is essentially you are taking their spine and putting it in on their face where they can now yeah. see it. You know, it's like, you're putting it in front of them and there is something really powerful. And I have a buddy that does, um, motion assessments and I don't think he videos it or anything. And I think that that probably would take it to a different level. Um, because even just the assessments, the inability to do things that seem basic, you know, like it's, it's you, you should be able to twist this way or bend this way or whatever. And when they can feel themselves not being able to do, he's a huge advocate of it. And he's not, he's not even someone that would be considered a, um, uh, you know, like a sports chiropractor or like a, I mean, he's a very traditional subluxation based chiropractor, but the fact is that what he's doing is impacting the, the, the patient's motion. And he yeah. is um, helping that person see that there's a problem and feel that there's a difference 
um, as he's taking them through that, that process. And, and he's a big fan. So this isn't just for, and, and we talked about this when we talked, you know, a couple months ago or whatever about the fact that this isn't something that's exclusively for like a, a, a sports chiropractor, because even your traditional chiropractors that are just correcting subluxation and, and, and adjusting the spine, it is affecting the mobility of that person. And if you can identify those things and demonstrate the differences that you're making, it's going to impact um, how your patients are doing and your, comp your compliance, your retention, all of those things. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people look at my practice or kind of see me as a previous athlete, um, know that I have a CrossFit gym and they just assume that I do all sports chiropractic. I'm 80% gen pop. Yeah. Right. I, I'm treating as many grandmas as I'm treating CrossFitters. Yeah. And it's, it's because these people need it. We're, we're all built on the same template, right? So we, yeah. we all, our, our needs don't differ um, only by degree, right? So yeah. we have yeah. the same template there, but um, no, it's the other thing I was thinking about when you were talking about, you know, the assessment is you can have somebody do a front lunge and they say, oh, see, I did it. Right. And, and there's a difference between task accomplishment and efficiency. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so you can they accomplish like that garbage task, but, exactly through yeah. massive compensation. You, you only have so many more of those reps left. Yeah. Look, look versus, at me. Exactly. You're, you're fantastic. <laughs> uh, but if you put them on film and, and you watch it together and then you put it in still frame, it's, it's very difficult yeah. to, to disagree that sometimes the perception and the reality uh, in the patient's mind as they perceive themselves as being this beautiful snowflake when in fact they they are a piece of gravel. Right? Listen, this has been yeah. this has been part of the weight loss world for years. It's like show a person a picture. Like show them show them themselves at an angle they don't normally see themselves. I mean I like it's that can't be me. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you see someone on video and they're all oh, that person's too fat to be me. It's like nope, nope, that's you. That's you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, I had a buddy, I remember this, this speaking of that, we, we were at, uh, we would do upper cervical, I did upper cervical seminar and we would video adjusting. So you would just actually just set up. So you'd set up and you would critique like the way the person's standing, the way your body is shifted, the way you stand, the kind of the way you went through the whole thing. And we would video it and then just watch it all together and make comments about this needs to be different. That could be changed. And one, this guy that I know, he, uh, um, he, he, he got videoed and they were like, uh, went through the critique and they asked him, they said, do you have any questions? And he's like, am I really that bad? <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said, somebody's like, the camera adds five pounds. And I was like, how many cameras are on them? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but it's, it's like things like posture, things like mobility, all of that stuff. I mean, we should. I think as chiropractors, I think it's a great idea to take a, a, a page out of the weight loss sector, which does very well, by the way, and show people what they look like. You know, if, if we have to make spinal health a vanity thing to get more people to take care of their spine, I don't think that's a bad trick to play. Not at all. And again, I don't think it's, that's another thing I talk with the students about all the time is, uh, okay, what sequential steps are you going to progress your patients through, right? And every single one of them is like, pain, pain, we're going to get them out of pain. I'm like, guys, that's, that's easy. Yeah. It, it's, it's actually pretty damn easy to get people out of pain. What are you don't actually even have to be a very good chiropractor to you get don't, people out of pain. You don't, sometimes time will, will do that, you know, with very little yeah. assistance. Yeah. Um, but if you're able to um, help that person on a very functional and global setting and start to develop a long-term relationship with them, um, you start to see, oh my gosh, this is good, obviously for my business, but it's only good for my business if it's good and highly valuable for my patient. Yeah. And, and now you just have a platform that allows you to kind of sequentially progress and have that communication. So more people are getting better care for longer periods of time. That is exactly what led us or the lack thereof led us into the depth of the pandemic of, of how crappy it was for us is because this hasn't happened yet. And now yeah. we're on the backside of that again, having all this opportunity for people who are just begging to be healthy um, because they've seen what a lack of health has, has, uh, has produced them or just the maintenance of lack of health. So never a better time to be a chiropractor. And, and we want this software to help people do, uh, do even better work.
Uh, so as we wrap this up, uh, can you tell people about your, give them your websites, how to get a hold of you connected, like kind of your, your, uh, how do people connect to you? Sure. Uh, tons of different ways. You can go to telecarerx.com. Um, you can request, uh, you know, go to our contact and just reach out to, uh, to us and we'll get back to you. You can request a demo. Um, we also have something called chiropcp.com. Chiropcp.com is where I put a lot of information for young docs and students um, that are kind of interested in the model that we practice in. So that's another way to get information, uh, a bunch of free stuff. I do a little podcast as well. Um, and then um, the last thing is on Instagram. You can just direct message me uh, at HPCDRJ, HPC Dr. J, um, and just start a conversation. My One of my massive passions is when I leave this profession that we've doubled our market share, right? I want to make money just like anybody else. I want to do good things and have fun toys. But at the end of the day, um, I would love to see more and more people experiencing high quality chiropractic. So if you're interested in that, reach out to me. I will put all of these uh, links and stuff in the show notes as well. So people don't have to remember them or write them down if they don't need to. So we'll, we'll put those awesome. in there. Uh, thanks, man. Is there anything else you wanted to say before we, we get on? You know, you thank me. I should thank you. Um you know, what, what you've done with Black Sheep DC, uh, which is what I felt like when I got, you know, when I was out uh, of school um, and now Rocket Cairo. Uh, it, I miss Black Sheep, by the way. Like that's, I know, that's... dude, I, you, you always said, I guess not a whole lot of people resonated with that, but I did, man, that, 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 that felt like me to a T when I was um, starting to go through. So um, what you've done, thank you. Thank you for giving me uh, opportunity to talk to, to your people and, and your network here. Um, and I just, uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad to help. I hope people reach out to you. I hope that they check out your software and I hope they give you feedback too. Like that's the thing, other thing I would say to you guys, when you reach out to Jared and, and you do a demo, don't be afraid to give him feedback. They're very much in the development process and, and ch as changing things and tweaking things to make it the best possible thing that it can be. And they're not going to get that without feedback. And Correct. so, um, you know, I would encourage you if you look at it, if you decide this is for me, then great. If you decide it's not tell them why and, and, you know, give them some info. Cause I think that that's super helpful um, through the development process. And I think everybody wins um, it, as the the better stuff like this gets. Absolutely. I think you hit that right on the head. And even if you do use it, when you do, we've had a lot of people say, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do this? And it's like, absolutely. Let's let's get rocking and rolling. So we're pretty aggressive in terms of, of what we want to try and do to create a successful experiences for the people that are using the software. Uh, but then we're humble enough to realize that we're we're kind of leading the the way in this arena, and that uh, we we have a lot to learn on what we can do to service our target market uh, better, faster. So yeah, any yeah. feedback that is like gold to us. Cool, man. Well, hey, I'm gonna wrap this up, and uh, we'll talk later. Okay. Love it. Thanks, Jerry. All right. See ya.